Good morning, Mario. And, and first of all, let me take time to uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to Lotus Limited and all of our members at, regarding your time with Team Lotus and Formula One. Many of our members remember watching your driving feeds live when they, when they happened, and they're ecstatic to be able to get a few questions answered by you today. Sure, no problem. Thanks for being here, by the way. Oh, thanks for the invite. And we'll start first with some of your time behind some of the Lotus cars that you got to drive. And it saw you behind the wheel of a few race cars that are considered historically important due to their design and their performance. So we're gonna cover those a little bit first. And of course, we're gonna start with the 78 and the ground effects car that a lot of our members are, are so interested to know some details about from you. And the 78 car really brought some technology that became uniform throughout the field. And during the development, it was kind of rumored that Colin Chapman and Tony Rudd agreed to keep the car secret because they, I think they knew that it was gonna be a really hot car. How much did you know about going into this, um, about the potential development that was going on to it? And when you finally got to drive it, what was your first feeling behind the wheel? You know, there's so much misconception on what you just said. Okay. Because um, uh, at the end of 1976, um, which in 1976, um, uh, Colin, when I joined after Long Beach, uh, he, he was apologetic. He said, Mario, he says, uh, I really don't have a really good car, you know, at this time. But uh, uh, at that point, I said, well, I said, Colin, if you come back racing full time, I said, uh, we'll make this thing work. And, uh, and that's really what he did. He just delegated uh, responsibilities for the car company, the boat company, and he did come back full-time racing because that's what the team needed. And uh, so at the end of the season, we all had a meeting. We all, there was, uh, the designers was uh, Martin Ogilvy, it was Peter Wright, it was uh, Bellamy. And, and uh, so we were all just kicking things around, you know, as to, uh, uh, what we should pursue as far as uh, the new car. And, uh, and this is some area that I don't get the credit, you know, where uh, a lot of people have a little amnesia, quite honestly. But um, uh, from a driver's standpoint, uh, my comment at that time was, you know what, uh, I'd like to have more downforce with uh, no drag penalty, you know, which, okay, oh, oh, you know, everybody laughing. Well, uh, at that point, um, you know, a lot of that was not, you know, known uh, as far as, you know, what we finally wound up with ground effects. But uh, I cited an example to them that sparked a lot of ideas. And that is when uh, I was driving the March car in 1974, uh, uh, STP was uh, actually, uh, STP was sponsoring the team, uh, uh, and but we had a you know a private entry, and we were in South Africa testing, and uh, and because of uh, obviously uh, altitude, the track at Kailami, um, you know you don't have as much engine power because of normally aspirated engines. So we thought, I wonder if you know how we can take some drag out of the car without really, you know, uh, compromising anything. And, uh, and the March car had two side pods, which actually, if you look at the photos of that car, it was like a, a, a shape of a wing. And, um, and so we said, you know what, those side pods don't do anything. They're really aerodynamic, you know, so maybe they create drag. Okay. And so uh, we took them off. This was during the test. We took them off, and all of a sudden, I started, the front end started flying on a car, and we said, oh my God, now I need more front wing and all of that, so, uh, and this is what I told them, I said, with those side pods, we were getting downforce, but those side pods didn't have a fence, in other words, to direct the flow, so a lot of air was spilling out, so they were not really efficient. So, the, the Lotus 78 was born, with side pods with a fence. And, and obviously, you know, it provided some downforce because um, the side pod was much longer, had, you know, the, the, the shape of a wing. And, um, and so, I went, okay, the car obviously had, you know, more downforce than we would have experienced without it, of course. But 
we really found uh, what the car needed when we were testing in Germany at Hockenheim. And uh, at Hockenheim, uh, the, uh, at the end of the long, two long straightaways, uh, I think it was called the Bosch curve, just almost like in, uh, in uh, Austria. It was a, a long right-hander. And I remember going through there and, and, I, and I telling Colin, I says, you know, Colin, right in the middle of the corner, I'm really feeling a lot, a lot of downforce. And, and he came to conclusion that the, the side pod was closing the, the you know, the, the uh, you know, the distance, you know, from, to the ground. And uh, so it was making the side pod more efficient. So he sent, I think, I don't know if it was Bob Dance or somebody, uh, to, to get some uh, plastic strips to cover, to, to, to close that gap. And uh, so I went out there and all of a sudden, oh, and, uh, but then, you know, three laps later, the stuff wears and everything else. So uh, in order to make it la uh, last, for a few races, we ran uh, brushes. The brush was like, uh, you know, <laughs> sweeping the track type of thing. But with the brushes, it was not as effective, of course. It was still spillage, but it was better than, you know, the plastic strip that which would, would have worn, you know. So... Um, and after the brush, that's where the movable skirts were born. Now, going back to what you're talking about as far as the secrecy and everything else, I think some of that is made up because we didn't know, we knew we were going to have a better car, no question. I mean, it was uh, uh, a lot of thought was going into it. But uh, the end result, as, to, as far as the proper ground effect, we didn't know. As a matter of fact, if you look at the, uh, the Lotus 78, even at the exit, of the diffusers, it's very busy, you know, it's not really clean, and this is what, you know, uh, they, you know, obviously they did a lot of that and for the Lotus 79, you know, just cleaned up the exit of the diffusers, and, you know, a lot of stuff was learned, and, and um, but again, uh, I take a little bit of credit for just implanting some idea as to why we started with these side pods, and that's a fact and that's a fact. A lot of our members might not realize or be able to get a good feeling for the type of downforce that you got from the, from the ground effects. Is there a good way to, you can kind of describe what it kind of felt like to go from a Formula One car in the years beforehand to the performance that you would get from the ground effects? And did it change at all how you ended up driving the car versus some previous models? No, I mean, uh, you know, Brian, downforce is downforce, and by, by that I mean um, it gives you a sense of stability, you know, through the corners. And there were a lot of drawbacks. We didn't, uh, we didn't have as much of an advantage as a lot of people think. You know, we had an advantage, but I mean there were a lot of other things that were creeping in there. You know, that, that were an issue. And uh, with downforce, uh, uh, you, you, you had to just uh, compromise uh, your spring rates and everything else to figure out, you know, uh, how to handle you know, the downforce that you get at top speed versus the slow corners. It was, uh, I mean, we had a job in our hands, you know, and, um, but, uh, but again, you know, going back to the downforce aspect, a driver, you, um, uh, you adapt, you know, to whatever uh, the car tells you, and, uh, but the feel of uh, stability and so forth, something that any driver appreciates, you know, it's what you're looking for. And, uh, and this was giving us, again, you know, some uh, downforce without total penalty of, uh, obviously, the surface aerodynamics, which is, you know, the wings. It would, you know, okay, one downforce, but you're going to, you know, go slower, you know, in a straightaway and all that. Um, the, the ground effects, is, there's still some penalty, but not nowhere near as to what the surface uh, wings are. We read an interview that you put out for one of the Formula One magazines saying that you enjoyed driving the 78, you found it a more satisfying drive than the eventual championship winning 79. Is, is, was that, am I quoting that correctly? And if so, why was that the case? Well, I mean, the 78 actually was a breakthrough, you know, so I was deriving probably a little more satisfaction 
79 was, uh, you know, something that was a, a continuous development. But the one thing that uh, uh, that I had a continuous fight with uh, Colin Chapman about the 79 was he never realized that um, um, we were running out of brakes. You know, uh, Ronnie <laughs> could tell you. Uh, what was happening is, as I said earlier, they had to clean up the exit of the diffusers in the back. And we used to have inboard brakes in the rear. And uh, so in order to be able to obviously clean up the, the area, they moved, Colin had Hewlin uh, cast a gearbox where half of the uh, calipers, brake caliper would be magnesium, and the other half were aluminum. And, uh, but they were right, the calipers were cast into the gearbox, which means they were soaking in all of the temperature from the gearbox. So um, early into the race, you know, with full tanks and everything else, which we, you know, you very seldom would run full tanks, but um, we always would be running out of brakes because the, the, the brake fluid would be boiling on the rear brakes and so you had to pump, you know, every, you, could, you know, you had a heck of a time, you know, just going on the street, you had to keep pumping, uh, the, the, you know, the, the brakes. And uh, I remember like uh, the one race in Monza where uh, I passed Villanova on the last lap. And, uh, and I kept trying to save the brakes, save the brakes. And, on, and on, I mean, I just, I thought my foot was going right through the front of the nose because, you know, I... Uh, I'd gone into the Ascari curve and uh, it was that because uh, we, we even... Almost every race that we won, we won, you know, with just very little breaks. So because of that, I used to really, I said, for God's sake, and I, and I would tell Colin, you know, and he, and he bugger off, you know, type of thing. And, and because as soon as the car would sit there, and then it's a mechanics go over and this, and the, brake, the brakes would be right there, you know, because the thing would cool down just enough or, or take one pump. But that they, it did, didn't, it, 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 did not believe us, you know. So we ran that whole basic season, and, and it was it really, really hurt me at the Glen. Because at the Glen, at the end of that year, I started, for, but I think we dropped out of the race anyway. But uh, I envied uh, Carlos Reutemann in the Ferrari because he was out breaking me so badly, you know. And, uh, and so, uh, like, we had some shortcomings. Like, everybody was not a better Rosa as far as, uh, you know, uh, even the wins that we've had. We fought it, um, but... Um, but overall, like an overall package, I mean, we were blessed, uh, you know, Ronnie and I and, uh, and Gunnar Wilson, you know, uh, uh, and uh, for, you know, with, with, you know, with just a, a wonderful, wonderful car, wonderful piece. I'd like to take a step back a little bit to your first drive in Formula One with the Lotus 49. Yeah. And what did it feel like to get into a Formula One car? Was it different than what you've experienced beforehand? And... Did any of your previous race experience prepare you for what you would eventually experience in Formula One? Well, the first part of the question was it really different. Oh, yes, it was, but in the right way. Um, and by that, I mean, uh, yeah, everything prepares you for something. Obviously, uh, um, when I uh, met Colin Chapman and Jim Clark back in 65 at Indianapolis when I was rookie of the year and he won the race, I finished third and all that. So I was trying really hard to get noticed, you know, by, by them because uh, back of my mind, I always had this, obviously, uh, this goal of uh, getting into Formula One. And uh, after the banquet, uh, you know, we we're saying our goodbyes, I said to Colin, I said, Colin, I said, someday I, I would like to do Formula One. And he says, Mario, I said, when you think you're ready, he says, you call me. So I called Colin, I said, I like, Colin, I'd like to do the last two races of the season, which would be Monza and Watkins Glen. And I uh, said, right. He said, I'll have a car for you. So uh, my first experience in a Formula One car was at Monza. And, uh, and, you know, what a better place, you know, because that's, you know, where my, my dream really began about Formula One uh, when I was 14 years old. And uh, so anyway, uh, we go and... and and I had been used to, again, the sports cars, you know, much heavier and, you know, and so forth. And we had one, you know, we won Sebring 67 with uh, Bruce McLaren and, you know, a lot of things happening. So, but then uh, I never uh, experienced a, a nimble 
Formula One, which is obviously the, the purest of the road racing machines. And as soon as I got in and, you know, fitted up and I went out there, I said, oh, my God, this is what I was waiting for. And uh, it just felt so much part of the car. And um, so we came away from Monza. We set a track record, you know, on that test. In fact, we beat the Ferrari that Chris Amon had run two weeks before they tested and they set a record and we beat that record. It was my first experience. And so I figured, oh my gosh, I said, uh, I, I love that. But uh, it's a long story. I'm not going to get into as to why uh, Monza didn't happen because I had to come back on a, fr on a Saturday to race in a Who's Your 100 in a dirt race and then go back. And because of the 24-hour rule, which they were going to waive, they didn't let us start. It was, I say, us because Bobby Unser, I got Bobby Unser a ride with the BRM so we could slipstream qualifying. And, and, uh, and that was something that uh, was very meaningful there in those days, Monza, to do some slipstreaming to qualify. But anyway, uh, my first... A real race uh, in Formula One was the Watkins Glen, and uh, and there's you know you know put the car on pole. Um, I again uh, I had never seen the Glen before. I never raced there. You know it was as foreign as any other track to me. Uh, but um, again the car going back to the field, the Formula One car, vis-a-vis um, -vis anything else that I had experienced up to that point, it was just right. I mean it was my world. You know I said that. Uh, this can definitely be my rodeo. Was there any driver in particular that, um, and you, you don't have to pick one, but maybe one that you really enjoyed a teammate battle or, or challenge with throughout your, your career? Yeah, for sure, Ronnie Peterson it was one. Um, there was, uh, um, you know, there was this misconception that he couldn't pass me on the track, which is cock bull, you know. And uh, he used to say, you know, like, okay, it, at the end, if there was uh, the last couple of races or something, that was uh, one didn't have a chance at the championship, you know. But, uh, um, you know, many times, like we were in Holland, you know, the uh, 78, and, uh, and I had an exhaust break on the right side, exhaust uh, pipe, and it burnt the um, diffuser uh, on the right side, so I didn't have much downforce on the right side of the, of the car. And I really struggled with that thing. And, and Ronnie was right on my bumper. And a couple of times he, he, he tried to get under me going in Tarzan corner because the, the corner coming onto the straighter was flat, just about. I mean, it had to be just like that flat. And I was really struggling through this. So coming on the straighter, he was really, and he slipped streaming and then chopped him a few times. And he says, you bugger all. He says, hey, why don't you let me at least lead a couple of laps, you know? I said, away you know? so like I said and it was great later on you know we just kid about it you know had a good fun um, and it doesn't always happen with all of them you know but uh, he, he was uh, he was just a, a nicest guy it was um, like brothers we were like well, he was much taller but we, but we were like brothers <laughs> I want to take a, shift, a quick shift back to some of the people that you've met throughout your time within Formula One and your racing career was there any particular person that you truly admired? And uh, if so, how did they impact your career development and, and how your career went? Well, you know, it's hard to really meet to, to choose, but I, I admired a lot of people in our business. I mean, uh, uh, icons that uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, you know, even to drive for, you know, like Mr. Ferrari, for instance, uh, as one. Um, I mean, you just, somehow you just really... You never could read them, you know, so you really wanted to please them somehow and try to get a little bit of a wince of a smile out of them or something. And um, uh, Colin, of course, uh, he, uh, to me, uh, what I loved about Colin was he was, uh, Colin Chapman was very expressive. You know, he wanted to win. And, um, and when, when you did win, I mean, he showed it. He showed, like, you know, throwing his hat in the air or something. Uh, he had that, you know, the beautiful uh, smile of acceptance, you know, and and all of these things really play huge, you know, but I had such tremendous respect for Colin because uh, um, I knew, I mean, look at the world champions that he created, you know, and, and uh, I knew that uh, even when I joined him, um, I said, if uh, if Colin comes around, you know, he starts doing, being uh, focused in Formula One 100%, I have a shot at this thing. 
and doing something good. And uh, so it's people like that that give you that tremendous hope and feel that I'm, at, I'm with the very best, can't do any better than this. And uh, But along the way, you know, the sport, uh, our sport is so rich, you know, with uh, uh, tremendous talents, you know, the designers, uh, uh, Morris Philippe and uh, uh, Ralph Bellamy and, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Tony Southgate. I mean, there's so many of these guys that I just uh, I admire so much. Uh, I, I hate to mention just a few because there, there are so many more. And um, uh, Adrian Newey, for instance, you know, which is, of course, contemporary. Um, he was uh, my engineer, you know, in 87 in, in Indy cars. And, and uh, I don't know if I uh, ever, ever uh, had a relationship with any engineer that I felt I was totally understood. And, you know, it was just like our brains were just one, you know, and, uh, and it gives you that extreme confidence, you know, when you have somebody like that. Uh, so, like I said, uh, I, over the years, you know, I had this, all these opportunities to, to work and, and then even be envious of others, you know, that I never had the opportunity to work with. But, uh, um, again, um, uh, the time that I, I was able to, to spend in a sport uh, uh, is, is so so rich, you know, with uh, uh, with the people, you know, that as you say, the people that I had the opportunity to rub elbows with. And we have a few questions left here, but to follow on with your comments about Colin Chapman, in 1968, during your first obviously race with Lotus at the Glen, you came back into the pits, and this story was retold to us by someone who was there and said. Colin, let me know when you want me to put it on pole. And uh, his response was, go put it on pole. And you did. This was your very first F1 race, first qualifying. And it was an amazing feat by any standard. While you were away from the pits, uh, and this story was actually retold to us by Bob Dance, Colin Chapman looked back at Bob Dance and goes, it's just like having Jimmy back. Hearing this gives me chills, and retelling this to you gives me chills. How does it make you feel? Well, uh, I, I don't know if those were the right words. You know, let me know when you want me to put it on pole. I mean, uh, uh, he knew darn well that uh, uh, he could see that I was out there, hell for bent. I mean, I was just really going for it. Um, I've never in my life announced, hey, you want me to put it on pole or I'm going to put it on pole. You never know that. Um, but uh, you know that the mindset, you could read that on anybody's eyes. Is there, you know, because uh, you come in and all you want is this little tweak here, this and that, and you go out there and you go faster. Um, and, you know, to have Colin, you know, my car and everything was just amazing again. And all of it plays because it gives you that confidence, you know. And, but again, um, uh, and for somebody like that, that's at that time is bigger than life, you know, you look at it, and I'm, driving for him, and he's watching me do my thing, I mean, you really want to reach. And that's, you know, and then you reach, and then and if you obviously come out with a result, I mean, that's it. At least I did my job, and I know he appreciates it and all of that. But, um, you know, Colin was a racer, uh, you know, through and through, and as I said, uh, he just, he wanted to win. He wanted to be at the top, and you wanted to be with him because you know that uh, he was going to give you every possible opportunity, um, you know, with the car and uh, all this effort that he had at his disposal, you know, to, to, to have to give you the tools to do that. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. We do have just one last question for you. And like I said, Bob Dance will be in the audience when this is shown. And he's been, he's been around our club for about, I think, just about 10 years now, and we've always known him as a very kind, gentle, and considerate man. So everyone in the crowd wants to know, what's the real scoop on Bob Dance? The real scoop, I mean, uh, here's a guy, you talk about, uh, in our business, uh, the best title you could bestow on anyone, a racer, a race driver, or a mechanic, race mechanic, you're a real racer. And he's a real racer through and through. Ask him one question, he says, Bob, how many engines, how many race engines 
have you been able, have you actually changed in a car over your career? Probably over a thousand. I used to look at these guys after the race, so I always change an engine between qualifying the race and everything else. And I, I mean, that had to be always a daunting job, but they were always really going into it. I said, and I always felt a guy with a career as long as Bob Dances is, uh, I always wonder how many engines have you changed in a, in a race car in your, during your career? And uh, that would be a great number actually to be able to, to publish. Well, we'll make sure we ask him. And I hear Clive still has him working on a few as well. Mario, thank you very much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure. My pleasure, Brian. Thank you so much. That was amazing. <laughs>